You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 440 of the podcast. And in this one, I chat with Jack, who has kindly agreed to share his OCD story with us. And in particular, we talk about an early parental loss. He shares themes of harm OCD, sexual orientation OCD, and paedophile themed OCD. Jack talks about substance use to mask the pain, how numbers played a part in his compulsions, being in an abusive relationship. He mentions suicide, attending the OCD camp, doing acceptance and commitment therapy and exposure and response prevention therapy. Jack discusses secondary spikes, what else helps him, self-compassion and much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. It's really great to get Jack on. I've known Jack for a couple of years now. It's always a pleasure to speak with him and he did a really great job sharing his story. So I hope you like it and I'm sure it'll inspire you. And Thank you, as always, to you guys for listening. It means a lot. And without further ado, here is Jack. Welcome to the podcast, Jack. Hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on. Um, and yeah, as you know, it'd be great to hear your OCD story in as little or as much detail as you want to give. Okay. Um, well, obviously, I'm I'm 38. I've had OCD for since I was seven, so over 30 years. And I think my story probably takes me back to being a child um five years old first day at school um back and find that my father had passed away mm. um don't really remember much i remember the day um but obviously for a child that was very traumatic um and i think you know that trauma as a child you know must have been a trigger um and then come about the age of seven um my mum got remarried and, and and i had a little sister and um starting to having to like open and close the fridge a certain amount of times um go through doorways a certain amount of times touching the door frame as i was going through and obviously you know if if i didn't do the certain amount of numbers or do a certain amount of uh things like shut the door in the fridge a few times then my sister was going to die that was what my theme was it was like you know didn't know what OCD was at the time. Obviously, this is many years ago. Just starting to have these really strange thoughts so that if I didn't do these things, then my sister was going to die. Um, and that was like, you know, really difficult for me because it was like consuming me. Um, and I think it got to a point when I must have been about between the age of seven and ten that I actually broke down and explained what was happening to me, mom. Luckily, she kind of had an idea of what it was. Or she went out and found out what it was and came back. And at the time, I think it was called the secret illness. Mm. Um, so she explained it to me. Um, I did go and see a therapist, but I, I didn't. It didn't last very long. It was like probably a couple of sessions. She, the, you know what she said to me was: every time you have an intrusive thought about, you know, your sister um, dying, then obviously flick yourself with elastic band, which is like you know, mm. the amount of times I was having these thoughts, you know, I'd have been flicking it all the time. So. Didn't, didn't didn't go through with that um and it didn't help at all to be honest and i think obviously back then OCD was probably a lot more misunderstood um and then you know coming up to like 11 12 13 the theme changed and i think you know being a boy back then you know people question their sexuality but it was all like you know if you the boys at school, like, at school would be like you know if you walk over free drains it makes you gay or if you walk underneath that sign you're gay so it was all very much about, you know, this theme changed from, you know, my sister dying to sexual orientation. Um, I was sexually active from the age of 14, you know, sleeping with, you know, with girls at school and whatever. I knew who I was, but it was always the what if, and that's what OCD is, right? It's the what if, you know, what if I'm gay or what if I'm a paedophile, what if I'm going to, 
hurt somebody, what if I don't like my girlfriend or whatever? That's what that's what it is. It's fear driven. Um, obviously I've got an understanding of that now. Um, but it really found a hook, really like, you know, really consumed me. And OCD become extremely difficult to it was difficult to function. Um, like for example, you know, I'd open my eyes in the morning, I would choose to thought, close your eyes, open them again, you know, until I could get the right number and the right image, get out of bed. I've already got my clothes on from last night. I couldn't get my clothes off because it was too difficult, too many compulsions. You know, walking out my fresh out of my door, back and forth, back and forth, right number, right image. You know, very, very disabling. Um, going in, it's like the shower. To have a shower is difficult. I have to get in the shower, out the shower. And each number, and each each number had a meaning and an image associated to it. So, like, you know, and it's some, some it rhymes. So, like, eight, you're not straight. Ten, you're like men. Or, mm-hmm. like, you know, when it manifests in something else, it would, like, you know, mean something something else in the future. So, each number and each, each um, yeah, each number had an, an image associated to it. And the more time went on, the less good numbers I had left. So, I'll be getting in and out of the shower like almost 600 times in my head. You know, I'd count to 20, then it'd be 21, 2, 3, 4, not 609, all the way 34, and I'll get up to 100, and, ah, bad image. Mm-hmm. I'd have to go again. So it was really, really, really difficult time. You know, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave the house, um, couldn't really function. It was just taking over my brain. A lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Um, and unfortunately, at that age, I started to abuse drugs. You know, I smoked a lot of cannabis, which made things a lot worse. Uh, did a lot of class A drugs, but it was kind of, I guess it was my escape. Um, you know, I was very angry for losing my father as a child. Very angry that I had this condition, OCD, you know. And back then it wasn't spoken about, you know, there wasn't podcasts and things like that. You know, I felt like the only person in this world that I've always been into people was having these thoughts and feelings um so yeah um ocd robbed me of my education i couldn't concentrate at school you know i just kind of dropped out of every school and going into like a people referral unit kicked out of there and end up being 15 years old living like an old man's life really i was you know going to work not nine to five and then you know going out in the pub and drinking the weekends and stuff and it was all just kind of master pain that i was in really you know, OCD was just horrendous, intrusive thoughts, numbers, you know, questioning my sexuality, even though I kind of knew I was and all that kind of stuff. Um, really painful time. And then I wasn't, I guess for me, like something difficult when my dad died, he, he always said that he was going to die before he was 30. And he died a week before his birth, 30th birthday. Now, for a child to make sense of that, you know, you just you just can't. So I was almost like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm going to die anyway. What's the point? I, I want to die. This OCD is so horrendous. You know, this condition I've got, I'm a freak. You know, I'm I'm, I'm just disgusted. The disgust is massive. I'm just a disgusting human being. Um, so yeah, it was it was a difficult time. Um, I'd always get into fights because you know I just had no self worth. Um, and I guess for me, like I always had this thing. I was like, I wish someone would just hit me across the head with a baseball bat, and I'd wake up and not know who I am, or I'd be somebody different. And maybe you know that would be a way that I could be cured of this horrendous illness. You know, it was pretty. It was really tough. Um, roll on to like being twenty. Um, my dad, and I always wanted to be a dad. I always want you know, it's a big thing for me being a father. Um. But then I ended up, you know, becoming a single dad. Um, OCD was horrendous. But obviously becoming a dad, somebody with OCD, the thing changed. Um, it turned into POCD, paedophile, themed OCD. You know, what if I'm a paedophile? What if I'm going to hurt my child? You know, and then obviously the numbers and the images would change, like, you know, and then the, the rhyming numbers would change, like, you know, nine, I'd never do it to mine or, or whatever, things like that, mm. basically. So the theme changed, and obviously that was like massive, massive amounts of disgust and shame, uh, guilt. You know, again, I just felt like I just didn't really want to be on this planet. You know, I'm, I'm this this mm. kid or this guy now who's you know having his horrendous thoughts, feelings, uh, intrusive thoughts constantly, constant amounts of disgust, having to do these compulsions on a daily basis, which were just consuming me. 
Um, but then, you know, I became, the, you know, the sole care of my son because his mom was not capable of being a mom. Um, it was a horrible court battle, etc. cetera. Um, but I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't avoid, I know a lot of people OCD avoid, you know, I was his dad and I wanted to be the best dad I could possibly be, you know, so I, you know, I didn't do any avoidance or anything like that, you know, I, I was being a good dad, I sure being a good dad. Um, entered into a relationship at that time with my ex-wife, didn't know it at the time, but it was a very abusive relationship, which actually lasted 14, 15 years. Mm. Um, and I just didn't know I was in an abusive relationship until the end. Um, it was a narcissistically abusive relationship. You know, I kind of was conditioned to believe that this relationship was what relationships are supposed to be like. And I think guess because I had low self-worth anyway, but I had a lot of empathy for everybody else. Didn't have any empathy for myself, but I had a lot of empathy for everybody else. Um and yeah, kind of finds relationship, a lot of empathy for her, but obviously that was kind of abused. Um I was in a cycle of like Love bombed, you know, as we know, mm-hmm. and like you know, the best person in the world and the best uh, husband in the world, the best dad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, it's great, and then devalued, like you know, I'm a bad father, I'm a bad person, you know, you're a disgusting human being. So discarded, you know, kind of relationship would break up every year, and then you know, kind of like then it's all my fault. If it was my fault, I had to get back into it and um, apologize, and you know, gaslit and projected on. I won't go into too much because that's probably a whole different podcast. But that was the cycle mm-hmm. that I was in. And that was kind of my whole of my 20s and the beginning of my 30s. Now, my OCD would kind of like change from the POCD theme, then it would change to the HOCD theme. Um, and it would almost go back and forth. You know, an interesting thing is when it was about the POCD theme, you know, you could stick me in a shower, in a gym shower full of naked men, and I wouldn't have any intrusive thoughts because that wasn't my fear at the time. Yeah. And that's the craziness of OCD. But then, you know, if it was about being gay and sexual orientation, you know, then I wouldn't have anything about the other theme. And, I, you know, you kind of, oh, I wish I was back for that because I'll be able to get over it. And I know a lot of people both OCD say the same thing, like, you know, I wish I had that theme or I had that theme because I'd be able to get over it. But back to the matter is OCD is fear. It's yeah. fear-driven. And whatever's implanted in your brain at that time, it will just find the hook and, 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 and you know, mm. drive you down that avenue of just, you know, doing compulsions and having intrusive thoughts on on whatever that theme is. Um. So, yeah, my, you know, my, I'm very successful in my twenties, to be honest. I had lots of businesses, uh, you know. I had two, two of the children, so lots, you know. I had a great family, you know, so the outside looking in, I think, looked great. But my OCD would kind of, if my life was okay, my OCD would almost be okay. But I had no tools. I had no tools to kind of, you know, deal with the flare ups. You know, as a child, I went to a psychologist for a couple of times, and as an adult, I went once or twice. And someone just told me to think about Mickey Mouse or sing my thoughts in a uh in in a christmas theme or like christmas song or, or or something and i just walked out of there like this person hasn't got a clue and i think that's quite dangerous with with ocd and as i'll go on to afterwards but like you know counselors list the whole list of things that they, they can cope with like alcoholism or, or depression anxiety blah blah blah, blah ocd and i actually haven't it, they haven't really generally got the skills to help somebody with OCD. I'm not saying all haven't, but from what I could gather when I was looking out there, it was just like mm. ERP is obviously now I know is 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 the way forward and, and act, et cetera. But at the time, I just felt like there was no help and I've had no help and I had no toolbox to be able to deal with anything. You know, I was almost like holding it, out, you know, holding it like I'd wake up in the morning and say, like, I'm not going to do OCD today. Well, that was never going to last, you know. Um, and yeah, OCD could just consume me again, you know. And people mm. could always tell when I was having a flare up. You know, I was really anxious, get depressed, um, hyper, hyper hypersensitive, you know, hyper vigilance. You know, I was like on edge all the time. If I go into a room full of people, obviously, like you know, scouring a room and analysing everybody. You know, if it's on the gay theme, it's like, is he attractive? Is he attractive? Is he attractive? Um, Fake attraction, you know, we talk about that. It's like, you know, you get anxiety, you know, you can find beauty in anybody and anything really. And like, I think for me, because the fear was like, oh, you, you know, you're this person, you're not really in love with your wife, you're not really, you don't really find your wife attractive. You know, you're a liar, you know, you're, you're gay, you know, 
you think that guy's attractive and then it'd manifest like i would have to say like look at him say no you don't and then, and then like you know you, your brain would almost try to say to you well you gotta look at him and say he's not attractive when you look at me and oh, he's attractive and it's just like back and forth back and forth um and then you get anxiety and that anxiety and you know you get start sweating and start getting uncomfortable you have to say oh i see look you're attracted that's attraction you're attracted mm-hmm. to him and stuff it was really hard you know because your brain tricks you into believing that's real yeah um you know and if it's about the pocd thing you know you can look at a kid and go oh you know it's a cute kid uh or, or you know it's a funny kid or, or why did you think that you know mm-hmm. you, you, you you know you, you're pedophile you're, you're attracted to kids it's like no and you know it's just like a constant back, back back and forth back and forth ocd would manifest in other things like you know I'd swallow it if I swallowed another bad thought. I'd have to swallow a certain amount of time, a certain amount of numbers, uh, blinking. Um, I, it could just anything, you know, lean on, mm. like I'm leaning on this t- here now. You know, I'd almost be, I couldn't touch anything. You know, it just could, anything. It could be anything, picking a phone up, picking a cup up, going through a door. I have to get the right number, the right image. And I just couldn't walk away from it, you know. Yeah. I'd just bite every time. Um it was just just disabling you know it's just so disabling um and i guess that kind of like went on throughout the whole of my relationship and when my relationship ended um back in 2022 um because i went and went into domestic abuse counseling to then realize that actually most of my adult life where the times i thought i've been happy but it hadn't it been an abusive relationship it was very difficult um to deal with and you know my OCD fared up really badly like you know my OCD I was comparing myself to other people the thoughts were just out, out of control um and obviously because I was like you know going for a divorce as well as trying to deal with domestic abuse recovery hmm. dealing with narcissistic abuse you come out you've got disassociation PTSD um you know, just pure trauma. I've, I've experienced a lot of trauma in my life. Mm. You know, a lot of things I've mentioned, and tra- the trauma from coming out of a narcissistic relationship is the worst I've ever felt. And I was ready to commit suicide. I was, mm. I was ready to commit suicide. I was like, my mom was checking upon me every day. Um, you know, she was really concerned about me. Um, I still had no proper help from OCD. So, you know, we're still talking 25, 30 years of o- OCD. Um, so I took myself up to the mountains as well as I did. Everybody was absolutely scared shitless what I was doing, but I just said, look, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got three beautiful kids. I've got to sort myself out. So I got a backpack, uh, got some stuff and just went into the mountains for five days into the Welsh mountains. Um and it was the most peaceful thing I've ever done. I was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Um, but mm. being out there on my own for five days, it's definitely a powerful experience. Mm. Um, obviously, didn't cure anything. I came back, you know, to face my fears. Um, and I think well, the first step for me trying to get help was actually trying to come on the OCD camp. Um, I don't really know what, what sort of pushed me towards getting help. I think I guess that, you know, now my life was like, there's so much pain I wanted to kind of think, do you know what, I need this, you know, I'm 30, 30 34, 45. Uh, I, I need to kind of like address this. Um, I've had this my whole life. Um, I'm in the pain. So I started to go on the camp. Obviously, you got accepted to go on the camp and it was the most powerful experience I've ever had. Um, I think, you know, the way, that obviously, you, you, you guys put the camp together was amazing. A lot of compassion, a lot of empathy. Um, I think what was interesting for me was people there, just such the most beautiful people. You know, I think mm. it was about eleven of us. I think about eight of us were there with OCD, mm. and um, it was just a beautiful experience. You know, everybody's there. And for the first time in my life, I'm I'm in a group of people who've got OCD. I've never met anybody with OCD in my, in, ever. Um, and these people are empathetic, they're compassionate. You know, great people. But all of them were like doing the same thing that I've been doing my whole life, sabotaging themselves, doubting themselves. You know, I'm speaking to people who've got the same themes of me as me, you know, they've got the same thoughts, same feelings, same kind of compulsions. So that's then becomes the shared experience. Um 
you know, and obviously the camp, the event, so I'm not going to talk about it too much because I don't want to ruin it in case somebody goes on there. But, you know, it was put together in a, in a, in a, in a way where, you know, there was no pressure. Um, it was a fun environment. You know, you felt comfortable to talk about your story, talk, felt comfortable to talk, talk about OCD. Um, and I came away, and as I came away from that, that camp, you know, something in me definitely changed. Um, cried on the way home. Purely because I was in a lot of pain, but obviously I was in to see those of those people suffering the way that I've suffered for that amount of time was, you know, it is it, I just felt compassion for them, I guess, and and and, mm. and the experience. And obviously we made a, a WhatsApp group, which we still talk all the time, which is again is great to support each other. Awesome. Um and you know, to 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 help each other along. Um and we've I've met, you know, we've kind of Go on a, a, almost a monthly Zoom call, um, but then for me, I still hadn't had any help for o, for OCD, um, and obviously I reached out to to Donny Say, um, who's been half me now for about eighteen months, hmm. and again, um, life changing, definitely changed my whole life and changed the way that I deal with my OCD. You know, I've got a massive toolkit now, um, you know. At the start, I didn't, you know, I kind of understood what the principles were of ACT. And obviously it's ACT, it's acceptance commitment therapy. Um, I'd never done any ERP in my life. A lot of people talk about ERP, you know, and obviously as I say, it's about a POC female kind of like, you know, going to a playground like, or, you know, going to shower at the gym or whatever it is, you know, kind of facing your fears. But mm. this approach is a lot more kind of uh, compassionate um and i kind of got it i just understood it and i think what was good for me is like you know to have a therapist who's had ocd um was very understanding of all the themes everything i was talking about um he talks about how he's got over it himself so for me it's like i thought it was incurable you know i was talking about it's incurable condition that you know the secret illness to see somebody that's kind of been where you are and is doing well is um was inspiring just like the people in the camp were inspiring because you know you've got to be brave so you know doing things like diffusion so you know as soon as i notice a thought an intrusive thought off my head you know instead of being stuck right in front of my, my, my brain or being a forefront of my brain something simple like i'm noticing i'm having the thought of mm. you know it's whatever the thought is you can't, the power of that is quite amazing. You give yourself some distance. Instead of it being right close, you kind of give yourself a little bit of distance. And you may have to do that a couple of times, but the diffusion technique has helped me massively, not only with the thoughts, but with the feelings. I'm noticing I'm feeling anxiety. Mm. You know, you suddenly get a bit of space, you know, it doesn't take it away, but it does ease it a little bit. Um, and then urge surfing, um, you know, massive one for me. And I think that's where a lot of people maybe struggle because you've got to be really brave. You know, you just had this, let's just say you've had a really intrusive thought about whatever intrusive thought about, uh, you know, a man or a child or harm or whatever it is. Gone over a threshold, your reaction is to go and put that right, you know, right number, right image, you know, feel safe. But to actually walk away and leave it there mm. and urge to surf that anxiety is where you start kind of getting one up on the OCD because, you know, you're, Telling your brain, well, actually, yeah, it's your brain sending this alarm signals, but no, that's 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 an old mechanism. This is a new mechanism, you know. And actually, what starts to happen is the anxiety starts to fade, and if the thoughts start to fade, and you're able to move on. Mm. But then, obviously, secondary spikes are always massive for me. Um, and actually, probably what my OCD has really been stuck with is a secondary spike. So for me, it's like, you know, if you don't have, if you don't go back to do that compulsion, put that thought right you're going to think about this forever. And if maybe it was just an image of a guy or just an image of a child or whatever, the secondary spike will go right. It'll get worse. It'll become more of a graphical image or it'll become more of an audio video image to try and get you to go back. And that's the OCD. And obviously I've learned that's the secondary spike, you know, and during my relationship, it's like, well, if you don't go and put this right, you're going to think about this during sex or masturbation. Oh no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to think this thought. So then obviously you're doing compulsions and rituals and everything else, your anxiety is through the roof. But I've got really good with that because another skill is workability. 
And you've got to say to yourself, well, okay, if I go back and put this compulsion right, then yes, it's going to give me some short-term relief, but ultimately I'm just feeding the OCD and I'm just going to be stuck in that same trap that I've been for the last 30 years. Hmm. So, you know, that, that's the skills that I've been, I've been doing. Uh, I kind of uh, do values-based exposure. Now, for me, this is probably what the ERP is. Um, every morning I sit on my meditation cushion and I used to meditate, but now I've been doing this work. It's like various based exposure is okay. Let's bring on one of those images that you, you don't want to think about. And then you're changing the relationship again. You know, actually I'm, I don't want to think about this person. I don't want to think about this. You know, that's what OCD is. Don't think about the white polar bear. You're going to think about the white polar bear. Your threat system saying, you know, you're this person, you're this pedophile, you're this, this, your, your game, you're going to bring these images on, but actually all these compulsions to try and push those away, or well, value space exposure and ERP as well. Let's just allow that then. Well, let's, let's, let's purposely go and put this image in our brain. And it's quite interesting actually, because when you purposely try and put your image in that brain, it's hard if it doesn't stick around so much. So mm. I do that on a daily basis, you know, bring an image up. Um, and then obviously you can do a technique where, it's dropping anchor, so dropping anchor. Notice your thoughts and feelings. Notice the image. Notice feelings, and then look at the room, senses, smells. What can you see? And you can do that a few times. But with the value space exposure, you know, you can do the same thing. Bring the image in. Notice the anxiety. Notice the image, and then obviously you can look around the room, or go into something else like you know what you value in the book, or you know going on with your day or whatever. And you relationship with the thoughts, right? And that's where the acceptance acceptance comes in. You know, I, don't, I can have these thoughts. It doesn't define me. It's not who I am. Um, I accept that these thoughts are there. And the paradoxical effect is actually when you accept the thoughts being there, you don't mind them being there. You're not doing the compulsions to match. They start to drift away. And, you know, I've probably been doing this now with my therapist for, like I say, about 18 months. I'm not doing any physical compulsions whatsoever. Now to go from, you know, almost being disabled by it, I've not even been able to kind of swallow, look, go through door frames, touch anything without doing compulsions and numbers. Numbers mean nothing to me. You know, I've had a massive improvement. I'm still on my journey. You know, I'm not, you know, mm. I'm still doing it on a weekly basis, but um, I have been relentless with doing the the, the work yeah. um, because of, you know, OCD is relentless with, with, with me, you know, 30 years of my brain being wired in this way. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a, it's a it's a pattern in your brain which the OCD thinks it's protecting you, right? And that, that's from the age of seven to I'm now thirty eight. My brain being wired in that way, you know. When I first started working with Johnny, I wanted to. I was accepting accepting that the journey could take six months, two years, ten years, or the rest of my life. And I think that changes the relationship with with recovery because if I said, "Look, I want to be here six sessions and I want to be fixed." It's not going to work, you know, mm. because I accept that I may have this the rest of my life. I accept that I may have these thoughts the rest of my life. I think the recovery journey is 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 better because I'm not expecting an end goal. I'm not expecting to be fixed at a certain point. Um, I guess the other thing that I do to help me on that journey, recovery journey, is give myself a good baseline. And that kind of happened two years ago when I obviously my life started to kind of fall apart with, you know, um, like I said, ending a domestic abuse relationship and suicide. You know, since then I've lost my business. I've I've been personally bankrupt. I'm in in out court with family things. You know, mm. if anybody looking in will think this guy should be falling to pieces. But actually, what I've done is I've lent into the pain by using the skills that I've been given with acceptance and commitment therapy, but also giving myself a good baseline. So doing yoga. So when I was disassociated, I couldn't feel myself in my body and all that kind of stuff, doing yoga. Um, I haven't drank a drop of alcohol for two years because mm. I know how it affects me and my anxiety. I read a lot of books about self-compassion, mindfulness, um, Buddhism. Um, I go to the gym four or five times a week. I eat clean food. Um, I do cold water therapy. You know, and all these things aren't fixes, but they just give me a good baseline. You know, if I'm eating shit food and I'm drinking alcohol and, you know, I'm not exercising and I'm just bossing around, then 
it's going to make it harder for the skills that have been given by a therapist. I think if you can give yourself a good baseline and then use your skills on a daily basis, you, you're giving yourself a good foundation to build off. Um, so, yeah, um, my, my life has definitely improved for my OCD. Um, probably loads that I've missed. I made loads of notes, but I'm not very really good at looking at notes. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where I'm at at the moment. Yeah, thanks for that, Jack. Really, really detailed, and, and thank you for for opening up. Um, yeah, you know, thanks for your words on the camp. It was great to have you on there. It was yeah. every year the camp's really awesome, but like that year was really good as well. And everyone connected, as you say, you're still mm-hmm. talking now with, with yeah. them all. Um, yeah, and I guess you know, going back to the domestic abuse relationship, because I think. At some point in your story, you said about, uh, was it with life's good, OCD was kind of less. Is that right? Did you say that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, and I'm just curious whether when uh, there was more abuse happening in the relationship, whether that really impacted the OCD or whether it was separate. I I, I guess so. Look, um, you know, before like OCD massive thing for me, I, I put that note like it's disgust. It's like disgust. I'm a disgusting human being, you know, to to you know, you're this I don't like the the the, the sexual orientation theme for me now and it doesn't affect me because I wouldn't care if I was gay or not, you know. Whereas younger that disgust was there. Um and obviously um the P O C D you know disgust was there. So w- when I got into this relationship, you know, and, and the things were good, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a businessman, life is good, um, my wife loves me, you know, I, I felt like I have purpose, you know, I'm, I'm, mm. I'm here for my wife, I'm here for my kids, my whole person for my family, so great. So then I guess I'd feel joy and I'd feel good. So OCD was still there, but it wasn't as bad. Like, you know, OCD was mm. always there, but I guess – it rather than it being really at the forefront of my mind, it was kind of in the middle. Mm. But I guess when I was being devalued and the abuse was there, and I was told, like, you know, I'm a bad parent, I'm a bad husband, and all the problems in her life was my fault. And you know, I'd, I'd often call it a disgusting human being, I'd, and she, you should use the OCD against me sometimes. I guess, yeah, this self doubt was coming back in, and oh, maybe I am this bad person, maybe I am this disgusting person, and OCD probably would manifest a little bit more. For sure, you know, it, it, it's got to have done, you know. And that was the cycle that I was in, um, you know. And I guess the answer to the question is, yeah, for sure. It, it, it was definitely going to be worse at times because I just felt low. I thought, you know, if, if, if my wife's left me again and she's gone and, or she's been devaluing me, it's like, you know, what? maybe I am this is just this crazy, horrible person. And, you know, it was, yeah, it d- definitely kind of, found a hook in there and would get worse yeah yeah thank you for that and i guess you know so domestic abuse is not something that people have shared too much on the podcast so just anything Mm -hmm. maybe you want to say for anyone listening that uh maybe thinks they're in one of those relationships like what would you have wanted to know it i guess it's difficult because i didn't know at the time yeah um it was only because after i left that relationship it was near the end of that relationship where I was so trauma bonded. I would do, I would have done anything for her and she knew she could have done anything to me. Um, I just knew things were wrong, but it's when I educated myself, I I kind of thought this doesn't make sense to me what's happened. And then when I went into domestic abuse relation uh, counseling, they kind of like, I just thought it was the last two years of relationship was what, when things went wrong, but actually it was from day one. And I think, I guess if someone, if something doesn't feel right in that relationship, you know, then you need to kind of maybe question it, you know, because now I would never go, I, I, I see the red flags. And I think if you see a red flag and something doesn't feel right, talk to someone about it or talk to, if you're in therapy, talk to your therapist about it or talk to a friend or family about it because they try and isolate you. She never wanted me to speak to my friends or my family about the relationship, maybe because they would tell me what, going on um if someone's beating you down if someone is trying to knock your confidence or someone is trying to control your emotions or it's obviously physical abuse is very overt so you know you're in a relationship an abusive relationship but if, if it's covert mm. um it's harder but you know no one's got the right in a relationship to control your emotions no one's got the right to put you up there and put you down there 
And if you're in that relationship where it's making you anxious or it's making you doubt yourself or, you know, you feel intimidated or you question your self-worth or your self-worth is being controlled, then you've got to try and get out, you know, you've got to try and get out or, or get help or, you know, speak to someone about it because then you might be able to dig a little bit deeper and, and, and escape, get things getting worse for you. Um, mm. And actually it was probably my first, she told me near the end that she said, oh, I needed help. I needed help. I need help. Let's go to a therapist. So I actually went and saw a therapist and it was just, a, it was just like talking counseling I went to. Mm. And we always did like this, Talking a walk in the woods, and I felt I liked that because I didn't feel the pressure of being in a room, and you know it's kind of therapeutic. And you know, and she said to me, she said, "You are in an abusive relationship. You need to get out." Mm. And it's that point. It was like shit. You know, maybe I am. And then when I challenged my partner at the time, that's when she left. You know, and that's when things kind of fell apart. Mm. Um, so, wow. Yeah. Well, look, thank you for uh, for for sharing that and. Um, g- g- Going to, back to Johnny and your work with him, you know, you've done yeah. great work. Clearly, you've, you're clearly put in the work and you still are, it sounds like, yeah. which is awesome. And there's a, a key part of ACT because you can do it in session, but you really need to be practicing outside a session as, as you've done. Um, yeah. With the ERP side of things, obviously, you've shared how maybe you're doing it out of session. Does Johnny, has Johnny done stuff with you in session around sort of exposures? and? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so... You know, yeah, on, on both fronts as well. So Johnny's obviously been working with my OCD and also happened with the trauma side. So mm. it's difficult because obviously I know some people bring up like videos of maybe children or videos of like someone at a gay party or whatever. Or, mm-hmm. But that doesn't affect me. It's all about intrusive images like, you know. So mm. Johnny's done the work where, you know, we'll do some values based exposure together and, you know, you'll say, like, bring us up to mind. So close, so close my eyes. Bring yourself back into your body. Talk about why you're doing this work. Connect with your values. Because obviously it's all values driven, you know. My values are, you know, basically, you know, I want to be able to accept any thoughts and feelings. You know, I want to be able to move forward in my life in a, in a valued way, you know. <clears throat> and then, yeah, you know, Johnny would bring in, you know, we'll think about this situation. Uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll talk about in the beginning of the session about, but in choice, choosing an image about this person or this child or, or whatever, and we'll bring it in, we'll do it together. So we'll definitely do it in session. And the same on the trauma side, you know, going back uh, in time. So space, space, bring an image of a, a time where you can remember being in, a, in an argument or, a, or an abusive situation. Um, mm. And then going there and almost talk, almost like going there as a, as a person and to the younger self and kind of talking to yourself in a compassionate way because that's the thing and i think that's the thing a lot of these therapists do with erp it's quite it'd be quite brutal you know if it's about contamination ocd or poc or harm or whatever it's something like okay go and chuck yourself in front of that lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots so then you got kind of not fear of that but then where's the cat compassion behind it so johnny's really compassionate you know, and talk to yourself in a compassionate way. You know, it's painful to have these these experiences, um, these thoughts, these feelings. It's perfectly acceptable to feel like that and talk to yourself in a really compassionate way, which really, really helps. Um, so he does that with like with the exposures and the RP, but also with the trauma and like almost talk to yourself in a way it's like you didn't deserve that, you didn't understand what was going on. You know, say some kind words to that younger version of yourself um you know and i'd say to myself look you know you're a good parent you're a good dad you're a good person um you know you didn't deserve this you didn't know what was going on and then almost kind of pulling myself away saying like you don't deserve this and you know mm-hmm. that's how i deal with the trauma with like i say with the ocds you know just bringing in an Im- image except image accepting the thoughts and the feelings you know it's difficult to have these you know it's a shared experience a lot of people go through mm-hmm. and just talk yourself in a compassionate way so i, I really to be honest i, I before I would be fearful. Well, that's obviously what OCD is scared of, of the thoughts and feelings. But if I have an OCD thought pop up in my mind now, I'll go and sit on my, my medica- meditation cushion and I'll just go towards it. I'll bring that thought in my mind. Mm. More to say, okay, bring it on, let's go. And it's, I don't enjoy it, but it's like I know that I'm strengthening the neurons in my brain rather than feeding the OCD. If I feed the if I go down that path, I'm feeding the OCD, I go towards it. And, and, and lose that fear and, and have the acceptance i'm strengthening my recovery of, of ocd yeah really good point really good point and, and good examples there um and you know earlier you said about 
self-worth like you didn't think you were like worth anything low self-esteem all of that yeah. has the work you've been doing with johnny especially with self-compassion has that started to shift that for you oh yeah big time i mean for the first probably six to 12 months he was doing it with me and i just look i just i just don't know i'm just not feeling it you know i'm just I was, I was doing all the things, all the tools he's given me, you know, talking self compassionately and stuff. And but my self-worth was low. And I think for me, I didn't know I had low self-worth as a child, as a teenager, but I obviously did, you know, I said, we're going to abuse drugs and fight all the time. And OCD did that to me. But then to have it controlled in an abusive relationship really magnified it. And when the relationship ended, my self-worth was just in, I didn't have any, you know, I was just, I was just, just disgusting human being. It's just riddled with OCD, you know, and shame. Um, but I'm in a place now where I know I deserve to live a good life. I know I deserve to be happy. I know, you know, I deserve to, um, you know, just have a values-based life. And, and just as much as everybody else, I never would have said those things to me before. You know, it's it's massive improvement, massive improvement. You know, um, I read a lot of books like from Pima Chodan, um, um and Christy Neff, like self-compassion stuff. I've changed what I read as well. And I think some of these mm. books and mindfulness alongside the work I'm doing with Johnny really help as well because it's about you know, not holding on to things. You know, that's the thing, like, you know, you can hold on to, oh, I want to be really happy, but actually that might have the paradox effect where you're always going to be sad. So just holding on to just like, okay, if I'm not feeling great, it doesn't matter, it doesn't who I am as a person, and just a lot of self-talk of self-compassion, um, which has really helped you. Yeah. So my self-worth has definitely, definitely improved massively over the last few years, six, six months. Yeah, that's awesome. And obviously, you know, I've seen you since the camp two years ago. It's pretty much two years ago <laughs> yeah. to two in two weeks' time, you know. Um, yeah. or by the time people would have heard this, it would have been two years ago. So um and you, you still, the, and I've seen you since then, but you, you, you're still the same person that I met on the camp, but there's much more of a lightness about you now, right? Yeah. That I'm sensing. Whereas on the camp, you could tell, you could sense there was a heaviness, right? And that's, yeah. you're at the camp for a reason, right? Because you're having a hard yeah. time, you're struggling. Yeah. But it does feel like, yeah, there's, there's just, yeah, like a weight's been lifted maybe. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess, I guess from you, you said something to me on uh, when I saw you at the OCD co uh, conference, um, and it really stuck with me. You said, um, "All the pressure polishes the diamond." I think you said to me. Oh, did I? <laughs> yeah, I did. And pressure and, uh, makes the just, diamond, probably. Yeah, and it it just yeah, and it just it just stuck with me, and I was like, right now in my life, I have literally. Like I said, lost everything, you know, from an outside perspective. I'm going through a divorce. I'm going through domestic abuse counselling. I've lost my business. I'm bankrupt. I'm about to lose my house. You know, I'm in court. Anybody else, like, you know, yeah. I was just, you know, contemplated suicide and stuff. But I've really, really lent into the pain rather than running away from it. You know, I could have turned back to drugs. I could have gone to alcohol. Mm -hmm. I could have just committed suicide. I could have done all these things. But... Something inside of me has just said, "This is your time. You've, you've got to, you've got to lean into this pain. It's going to be difficult." So, like I said, I did all those things that give me a good baseline. Yoga, cold, cold water therapy has been massive for me. I can have my head, be in my head, getting a cold shower and a cold tub, and it really kind of helps with that. Gym has mm. been massive for me. Eating clean food, reading, and the work that I'm doing with Johnny, I kind of like I said I really took to it because I understand it and understand the principles of it um and just had a massive increase of acceptance of the journey and acceptance and i think if you can really truly accept anything accept any thought any feeling any situation in your life it's quite a powerful place to be in mm -hmm. because you're just stuck in that point where actually things will kind of bounce off you a little bit and there's times you know like I can go to therapy and with Johnny one week and I can be like, you know, we don't need to go that week, but I'm going because I'm strengthening my skills. Sometimes, I'll, you know, I'll say this has happened, this has happened, this is OCD, and I kind of notice it a bit more, but mm. definitely a much, much better place. And I think the acceptance part is, yeah, I feel great now, but I feel okay now. But then actually next week I might feel like shit, but I accept that too. And actually I'll bounce back up, you know. So, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, so, um, yeah, like nothing is permanent, right? And yeah. you're going through a lot of tough things, 
currently in the past couple of years, but you're obviously deciding to grow from it, which yeah. is a hard decision to make, but obviously you're bearing it, right? And you you grow in even even in spite of it all. So that's yeah. really inspirational. Um so uh words of hope for anyone listening, what would you tell them? Words of hope for anyone who's got O C D would be you're not alone. Because that's that's the main thing is like you feel alone. So you're not alone. You're brave because living with OCD on a daily basis is traumatic. Yeah, so you're brave and it can get better. If you can find the right help and the right therapist, you can definitely get better and you can live a fruitful life. Nice. Nice. Um, pick up the phone, call the 20 year old you. What'd you tell him? Probably have a few words, but um, if I could pick the phone up, I'll tell him I love him. That mm-hmm. that's that's something I'd say to him. Then yeah. it's going to be tough, but you're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he'd want to hear that, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure he would. Um, and you got a billboard um, in the Midlands. What, what do you want written on the billboard? Something simple, but I just think that it's such a powerful thing. It's just. Be kind to yourself because I think with that so much opens up for you. Um, So, yeah, be kind to yourself. Nice, nice. And then lastly, anything else you wish you could have said or shared today? There's probably loads that I could have said, um, but obviously, no, I I think that I've kind of touched base of the overview um, and I'll just enjoy talking about it and I want to be able to talk about it more. So, you know, for Mm. me, uh, I feel like this is the beginning of something. Like I want to be able to talk about OCD, you know, 30 years, 31 years of OCD uh, and its ups and downs. I want to be able to kind of uh, help other people on their journey, really. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story, being open, vulnerable. I appreciate it. It's always good to see you. Yep. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast. And thank you to our Patreons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits, then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us, please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.